Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as we continue in our Roman study this morning, um, I've got a, a new lesson here, lesson seven. Um, yeah, so, you know, what, two and a half months, three months later, we'll start lesson seven. Maybe. We'll see. I may or may not have some remarks about a recent Supreme Court case that I'd like us to consider um, as we go through Romans here. Because in effect, that's what we're talking about in Romans, right? What we're talking about in Romans, um, how does the church in America, how should the church in America look at this letter from Paul to the churches in Rome? And so um, we will take a look at that. Um, we'll finish the lesson we were on last week that we almost got all the way through, which is miraculous. Um, but we'll finish that, and then uh, I've got a couple of remarks, and I'm actually going to share some articles with you f that it were sent out in the wake of the Dobbs ruling. Nobody knows the name of the ruling, but it's actually the Dobbs ruling, which is the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Okay, and so, yes, amen. And so, we will talk about that, um, and I'd like to share two articles with you, as I said, one from a, uh, a very specific perspective, I think you'll get the hint, and one from a different perspective. Um, and I think it actually does a great job of showing the fracture in the church today. Let me say that again, and I'll get to it in a moment, but I think it does a great job of demonstrating the fracture in the church in this country. And I think when you read the two in light of what we're studying in Romans. Because again, though we look at America right now and it's kind of abysmal setting today, um, we certainly cannot say that it's worse than how Rome was when Paul was writing to the churches in Rome, right? And so um, as we look then at this, what's Paul's response? And this is the whole point of the book of Romans. Paul's response to what's happening in Rome and division in the church is this. Preach the gospel. That's what his response is. Preach the gospel. As he says in other places, right? I, uh, I knew nothing but to preach Christ and what? Him crucified. He didn't say Christ and the libertarian party or whatever, you know, the emperor's party or whatever it would have been in Rome. He said preach Christ and him crucified. And so you'll see, I think, a sense of this in these two articles. I'm on uh, the email list for both. And so I got these two, and it was, it was clear as day to me. So we'll get to that. That's kind of our intro for that um, in a, that we'll do in just a few minutes. But I'd like to finish our lesson first from last week. Now, reminder, there is no Sunday school next week. We will be doing a potluck, by the way. I'll be adjusting my microphone the entire time because as I was walking back there, I hit the corner with the cable and it ripped it off of my head. So, which didn't so much hurt as scared me that I was going to, you know, get in trouble with the sound guys that I just ruined the microphone. But anyway, it's out of whack a little. Um, so we were talking last week. We were in Romans 2. If there's anyone who was not here last week that would like a copy of the study guide, from last week, my brother's got it here. I think we have maybe 10 or 15 copies left, something like that. Um, so that's from last week. And Brian, there's, you know, Larry raised his hand. Um, so there's a couple on the other side as well. Um, but again, I just, we'll go through a little intro here because we have a couple people that haven't been here. And so just a little bit of intro. And then again, um, we'll stress Paul's argument in all of this. So by introduction, by way of introduction, um, by way of introduction, the whole point of Romans is the gospel. Romans 1 through 3 says you're all sinners, right? Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 1 through 3, that's the focus. Then Paul shifts, right? And it's now, the gospel message that you can receive Jesus Christ by grace through faith. 
not a result of works, as he'll say in Ephesians, right? The idea then is salvation, this presentation of the gospel. You're all sinners. Here's the gospel. And then starting in Romans 12 and moving forward, now that you have the gospel, this is how you live, right? Romans 12, 1, be a living sacrifice. Romans 13, this is the one we don't like right now. Submit to the government. Um, and so that's the whole rest of the book. So it starts with you're all sinners in need of salvation. And then it goes to here is salvation by grace through faith. And so right now what we've been focusing on, Romans 1, is the Gentiles' need of a Savior. Romans 2, because the Jew says what? The Jew's like, yeah, they do need a Savior. Those guys are sinners. They are reprobate. They hate God. And then Romans 2, obviously Paul says, oh yeah, so do you. Romans 2 is about the Jewish need for salvation because the Jews, like the Gentiles, Paul says, will deserve wrath. And so we read last week, and I'll read it again here for you. Um, if you have that note sheet, it's at the top. Romans 2, verses 17 to 24. Paul says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent... Because you are instructed from the law. And if you're sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Right, so Paul's starting pretty heavy here, right? Like, yeah, you guys, you got all this stuff. Do you teach yourself? He says, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So again, this is targeting um, the Jewish people. Uh, I, I've told you in the past, over the last two weeks, that in this, many people today look at this and say that this applies to Christians, that that's who Paul's talking to. That's absolutely not the case. Paul says repeatedly through chapter 2 that he's talking to the Jews. Now, is this applicable to us? Like, can we then take it and use it as a heart check for ourselves? Can we look at our own hearts and say, I don't know, are people blaspheming God because of the things we say and do? That's a really important question, and we'll come to that here shortly. And so we talked about this, um, the, the key here in the law, right, that, um, that Paul targets these five blessings, right? He says, um, you have these distinguishing characteristics, and you have these blessings in relations to the Gentiles. And so we talked through that. Uh, and then he says in verse 23 that they boast in the law while dishonoring God by breaking the law. And so that's where we left off. And we come to this final verse of the section. Again, we got most way through this. If you'd like to hear all of the thoughts on that, may God have mercy on your soul, but it's on YouTube. If, I don't know why you do that, but you're welcome to if you need to. Um, but so we come to verse 24. God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Isaiah 52.5 is where we think. There's two passages where this, this is a quote from Paul where he's quoting from scriptures. Um, and we think probably it's this passage, but it's either Isaiah 52 or Ezekiel 36. Uh, I don't think I put that in your notes. I think I put the verse, but not the actual. I put the, the reference, but not the actual verse. Here's what it says in Isaiah 52, 5. Now, therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing. Their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. 
So we think that that's what Paul's quoting from, although he takes some uh, liberality with, with how he quotes it. Um, but I think this is an important point, right? Isaiah is talking about God's chosen people. First of all, Paul flips that to the Jews, right? Back to them. The Gentiles despise God because of you. That's a really important point. And I think it's something we need to think about. Um, my, in fact, I'm couching what I have to say to you this morning about the Roe v. Wade or the, the Dobbs ruling um, in that language. Will they blaspheme God because of you? That's a really important question. Um, and so we'll come to that here in just a second. The second verse that it may come from, Ezekiel 36, 20. But when they came to the nations, uh, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, and that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they, they had to go out of his land. In other words, because the people of Israel uh, had been punished, because the people of Israel had lost in these military campaigns that took them into captivity. Where's your God? Where's your God? If your God is so powerful, how was it that we could just take you over so easily and put you into slavery in Persia, in Assyria, in Babylon, and etc.? right? That's the argument. Are they blaspheming God because of his punishment to his people for not being obedient to the covenant. So again, both passages are talking about Israel's oppression by foreign powers. Brian, can I have a drink of that real quick? I didn't bring water up. Brotherly love. Thank you. Okay, so... Um, again, both are passages talking about Israel's oppression. Uh, Israel's disobedience led them to being carried away in exile. They were a conquered people, and yet they claimed to be chosen by God as the only God. And this led to their mockery from the Gentiles. The Isaiah text, interestingly, and I don't know if this is in your notes, so um, pay attention to this. I don't remember if I kept it in there. But the Isaiah text occurs in the middle of a prophecy about Israel's future deliverance. Well, who brings about Israel's future deliverance? Jesus Christ and God, right? Like this is, in the end times, um, the, the number, the promises to Israel being fulfilled, that's what, what Isaiah is talking about here. So it's interesting that in the midst of this, we see a seed of the gospel, uh, and I, I point this out. Paul likely makes the point here that Israel remains in exile as a product of their sin. Israel was still in exile. Who were they under the control of at this point when Paul's writing? Rome, right? Rome controlled Israel. And in fact, uh, within 10 to 15 years of the end of the writing of the book of Romans, Jerusalem will be destroyed and the diaspora will occur, right? The Jews will be forced all over the world and there will be a gathering again of Jews back to Israel. So in some sense, though, so while I think this is true, while I think Paul is making a point here that they may still be in exile today, right, under Rome, I think it could be simpler than this. I think that the hypocrisy of the Jews who claimed to be God's people but failed to live up to the law, led the Gentiles to blaspheme God. By the way, do any of you have Facebook? Go to your Facebook account and read all the things right now about this Dobbs case. I do so at, at your own risk here. Because um, I have people, in fact... Um, I have people that, students that I taught and kids I've coached, um, people that I count friends who are rejecting religion now because of this ruling. Now, they're not rejecting religion because of the ruling, right? They have already rejected their faith is what has happened, and this ruling is exposing that, okay? But 
Uh, yeah, exactly. It's the excuse. Um, but to give you an idea, um, heavily, heavily edited. Sorry, I keep going to the wrong place. Heavily, heavily edited. I took a screenshot of one yesterday. Here's what someone said. Nothing makes atheism more attractive than American Christianity. And then a kid who I know very well, coached for four years, had in class for two years, um, writes now for, for NFL.com for the San Francisco 49ers, says this, as it is, there are churches and pastors who spew off political rhetoric, but then turn around and quote a scripture. The hypocrisy shows. I wouldn't say he's wrong. I wouldn't say he's wrong. Of course, I can mention all the other ones that say, you know, F God, F Christians, F the church because of this ruling. Now, the ruling was right. Amen. Let me be adamant. I can go uh, on several different spectrums. As a former government teacher, um, Roe v. Wade should never have happened. It is a gross exaggeration of the 14th Amendment to apply that to something like abortion. That should be a 10th Amendment issue, a state's rights issue. Okay? Now, news to the church. Abortion is not over in America. It is now just simply a state issue. So, from a government teacher's perspective, what I would suggest is is that this ruling was the correct ruling by a court correctly applying the Constitution. Okay? So, I want to be very clear. I agree with it on that level. I also uh, agree with the idea that we're doing things that limit abortion. If, in theory, it's limiting abortion, I will argue to you that it does very little to limit abortion. But at least there's progress being made, right? Right? Um, and so I want to be very clear that I absolutely support the Dobbs ruling. It's a shame that I feel like I have to do that, right? But I am going to say some things to challenge you today um, in the wake of that ruling that I think are really, really important for the church. So though this passage deals with the, with the Jews... I think we can use it as a stress test for ourselves. Are we claiming blessings from the Lord but failing to live obediently? Are we claiming blessings from the Lord but failing to live obediently? For example, if you did have Facebook and you posted about your excitement about the Dobbs case, would that reflect the fruit of the Spirit? Or would it be more reflective of someone who just won the NBA Finals? I think that's an important point. And so, are we being, are we being the Christian we're called to be? Are we being obedient in the things that we're called to do? Are we loving our neighbors? Because loving our neighbors is not putting abortion in their face. Period. In fact, it will mean other things that I would suspect that most of us are not doing. Us, I want you to hear that, right? Not you, not you pagans, but us, we, the church, need to be doing that I would argue we're probably not doing, but we better be doing. Are we claiming blessings from the Lord but failing to live obediently? Are we failing in our mission to be salt and light because our testimony is jeopardized by our practice. I remember John MacArthur, I was at a um, uh, Grace Community. I, I've only been there a few times, maybe a dozen total. But I happened to be um, at a college group Q&A where they brought MacArthur in for the Q&A. You could ask MacArthur any question you wanted. I may have told you this, but um, there's new people, so sorry. Uh, anyway... In like, uh, I think it was 92, and you may remember that they, they, people were chaining themselves around abortion clinics, right, to, to make this political statement. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, they asked MacArthur, how do you feel about that? MacArthur's, question, MacArthur's response to that question was absolutely spot on. 
Here's what he said. I don't know what to think about that. What I do know, MacArthur said, is that if everybody who chained themselves around an abortion clinic befriended, loved, and shared the gospel with someone considering an abortion, we would change the abortion debate in this country. That, I think, is really significant. I think that is a spot-on answer. Are we failing in our mission to be salt and light because our testimony is jeopardized by our practice? Are we living out the gospel? Are we claiming orthodoxy, claiming orthodoxy, but failing in orthopraxy? Okay, orthodox is the, those beliefs, those doctrines, those scriptural doctrines that have been handed down through the church for two millennia, right? We are an orthodox church. We're not Greek orthodox or Eastern orthodox, but we practice orthodoxy. Now, orthopraxy then, as I spit on the podium, COVID, um, orthopraxy is, um, are you actually practicing your faith? Are you doing what the doctrines call you to do? There have been a lot, obviously, who claim orthodoxy but fail in orthopraxy. Are we failing to love each other? John 13, 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, are we as a church unified? I would argue that we're pretty unified here. Is the church in Sheridan unified? I would say probably so. I've never seen a region where the pastors get together and pray for each other and and, and share their struggles with each other and the things that we do here. By the way, led by Gary Kopsa. Um, it's an incredible thing. Most pastors have turf wars, right? Not here in Sheridan. Um, we're, we're really blessed by that. Um, how about Wyoming? Is that true in Wyoming or true in America? I would argue that the church is not very united in our country. Are we causing unbelievers to blaspheme the name of God because we fail to walk in obedience to what we proclaim? So I remember when we were in the state that shall not be mentioned before we moved here, California. Um, when, uh, when we were in California, um, they had just tried to pass, and this is one of the first times, they had tried to pass a gay marriage amendment to the Constitution. And I heard an interview on the news of someone who was a proponent of this. And um, listen, what he said is not true. It's not true of their community, let me just say that. Studies show that the homosexual community is in no way um, a monogamous community, right? So I don't even want to go down that path of trying to prove him right. But I think what he said bears uh, us to hear. Here's what he said. You should allow gay marriage because then we'll show the church, then we'll show the church what a committed relationship looks like. Now, it's not true of them, study show. But studies show it's not very true of the church either. The divorce rate in this country is uh, over 50%. Over 50% of marriages that begin today will end in divorce. You know what the divorce rate is in the church? Over 50%. Over 50% of the marriages that begin in, in the church will, will end in divorce. So, again... Are we causing unbelievers to blaspheme the name of God because we fail to walk in obedience to what we proclaim? That, I think, is an important thing for us to consider. I'd like to share with you a couple things about uh, these two articles about abortion now, if I may, um, about this case, not about abortion. Um, and, and again, I want to be very clear. I'm absolutely in support of the ruling. I've argued that in my classes, probably at some risk to my job for some time. Okay? Um, so, very much so. 
and I'm incredibly pro-life. Like, I, I don't understand folks that are like, well, in cases of, of rape and incest, we should allow it. But to me, that makes zero sense. Either abortion is wrong because of what it is, or it's not. And so that makes no sense to me. I, I never understood that position. Um, so in my mind, Scripture's pretty clear, right? We are formed by our Creator. Um, he knew us in the womb. Psalm 51, David talks about that. Um, very clearly, abortion is unbiblical. Okay? So that's where I stand. Now, I will tell you, for all of you who don't quite understand how this works, this was really an issue of states' rights versus federalism. Does the national government have the right to mandate that all states have to allow abortion? That was really the case that we're talking about. Roe v. Wade said yes. This Dobbs case, the court said no. Um... What does that mean? Well, now that means that the person whose heart, who, the, the woman who's pregnant, whose heart says, I want to get an abortion, does that mean she can't have an abortion now in Wyoming? Well, it means you can't have it in Wyoming. It also means that all you have to do is drive to Billings or Denver. And in fact, there's businesses like Starbucks, Disney, Dick's Sporting Goods, Amazon, um, who was it? Alaskan Airlines, Patagonia. Uh, There's one of the big uh, financial firms where you, by the way, you probably have investments in. Morgan Stanley, yep. Have all said, well, we're going to pay for people to go get abortions. People who work for us, we're going to pay for them. Listen, I've told you before, I'm not a real social, political boycotter. It's just not who I am. Um, having said that, I, I, you know, I've looked at how much Starbucks co- charges for coffee, and I thought, man, this is expensive. I used to be able to say, you know, that and a quarter will get you a cup of coffee. Now it's like that and $7 will get you a cup of coffee, right? Like, like Starbucks is expensive. Well, what does this tell me about Starbucks? It tells me they've been overcharging me. If they can afford to drop, you know, several grand to transport someone for an abortion, that's what it tells me. So we have, we have to understand the issue of abortion has not, has not changed at all. The heart of abortion has not changed at all. The people who desire an abortion still desire an abortion. This is not a ruling. I actually read this yesterday that this is a redeeming ruling. There is nothing redemptive about this ruling at all. Nobody is getting saved as a result of the ruling this week. It is not redemptive. So the reality is, very little has changed except for now, the fight has gone to the states, right? And so states like California are taxing their people to make allowances for other people to come there and get abortions. That's why people leave California, right? Like, I mean, the reality is that people are still going to get them and the battle will go there. Um, I heard someone, and I don't, listen, I won't call them a liar. I won't say it. Um, Someone said, well, you know, statistics have been trending against abortion. You know that that is not true. I, in fact, went to four major statistical studies, Gallup, Pew, uh, and two others, who studied the issue of abortion. In fact, the last study was done in March of this year, and in March of this year, the gap was the second widest since they've been doing this since 1975. More people today support abortion And this was a simple two-question thing, abortion or no abortion. 80% of Americans, according to this study, maybe higher, I think the number opposed to abortion who wanted it illegal was 13%. I got a newsflash for you. If you think that Roe v. Wade is the end of the battle, 
you're confused about how America works. If 13% of this country is opposed to abortion, period. And by the way, I would argue that that's the better number. Because if you're in favor of abortion in cases of rape and incest, you're in favor of abortion. Now you're just haggling over the details. So in fact, in fact, if only 13% of Americans are opposed to abortion in a democracy, now you do the math, majority equals what? In government, we talk about it as 50% plus one. You tell me if you think that we're going to win this abortion debate. We might win it in Wyoming. By the way, don't go to the high school and ask students there what they think. You're, we're not winning the abortion debate. We won a battle. It was an important battle, and it was a good battle. It allowed us to have battles where now we can make it illegal in our little you know, slice of heaven. But the reality is the abortion debate is not over. And in fact... In fact, we will still continue to lose this debate barring some major redemption event that occurs in this country. And I said that for a reason. I use that phrase for a reason. I want to read to you um, what Ligonier, R.C. Sproul's group, um, what he had to say. It's kind of a lengthy article and I apologize for reading to you. If it was... If I could have just got it to one page, I would have done that and given it to you. But here's, here's what they said. Circumstances change. Laws, courts, and administrations. Make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah, okay. Circumstances change. Laws, courts, and administrations come and go. Elections raise up and cast down the mighty. By the way, um, for those of you that are very politically involved, right, um, again, you'll remember we're precinct committee people, at least for a few more months um, here for our precinct in Sheridan um, for the Republican Party. Okay, so we're politically involved, Jen and I. Um, but for those of you that are like us, that are politically involved, um, do you know what's likely or what I think has very conceivably occurred because of this Dobbs ruling? Which again was the right ruling and I'm glad that they made very likely, um, the Republican Party will lose elections throughout this country in November. All those, all those ones that were skewing Republican, we have now motivated the, the you know, 80% of people who are in support of abortion, who are writing things that you would never write on Facebook ever. We've now motivated them. Now, that's not a reason to vote, you know, to be against the Dobbs ruling at all. Again, I want to be clear about that. When I was um, teaching, this is why I do that. When I was teaching, someone said that Barack Obama was the Antichrist on talk radio in 2008 during the election. And I walked into my AP, right? This is the creme de la creme of the students. My AP class, and I, I told them this, and I said, we could not be doing that in our politics. Barack Obama is not the Antichrist. We can't do that in our politics. We can't call people things like that. I'm not kidding. That class ended. Our principal, Darlene Wheeler, was at my doorstep. And I'm at the far end of the sea wing Was at my doorstep within three minutes of the bell ringing saying, Kevin, you can't call Barack Obama the Antichrist. And I'm like, you're right. That's what I just said. <laughs> right? So but I want to be very clear. I support this ruling, okay? Now, having said all of that, Having said all of that, um, we've probably motivated the left in a big way here. So think about if these things do in fact roll that direction, which anyone who tells you right now they know what's going to happen in November is a fool because things are going to change, right? But, um, but just understand, you could see enough majorities in the House and the Senate with a liberal president to pass a federal protection of abortion that will be constitutional. So again, where's your faith? Is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or is your faith 
in the Republican Party, in the political process of America, in the U.S. Constitution. Where is your faith? Here's what, again, Ligonier said. Circumstances change. Laws, courts, and administrations come and go. Election ra- elections raise up and cast down the mighty. Popular opinion waxes and wanes. But through it all, the callings and responsibilities of Christian in this poor, fallen world remain the same. Taking our stand for life wasn't first thrust upon us by the U.S. Supreme Court in their 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. And we are not relieved of that duty by its now overturning this year. The pro-life movement is not a recent phenomenon or an innovation. Rather, it is 2,000 years old. It was inaugurated on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. It is best known as Christianity. Caring for the helpless, the deprived, and the unwanted is not simply what we do. It is who we are. It always has been. It always will be. Life is God's gift. It is his gracious endowment upon the created order. It flows forth in generative fruitfulness. The earth is literally teeming with life. And it has scriptural references throughout. If you want a copy, I'm happy to give it to you. And the crowning glory of this sacred teeming is humankind made in the image of God. To violate the sanctity of this magnificent endowment is to fly in the face of all that is holy, just, and true. Sadly, at the fall, mankind was suddenly destined for death. We were all, at that moment, bound into a covenant with death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Proverbs 14, 12. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. We will, this will be uh, Romans 3, verses 9 to 20, okay, that will be in soon. All have turned aside, together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive, the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are abortion, no, I'm sorry, are ruin and misery. It's not new. In the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It is no wonder then that abortion, infanticide, exposure, and abandonment have always been a common part of fallen human relations. Since the fall, men have contrived ingenious diversions to satisfy their depraved passions and child killing has always been chief among them. Virtually every every culture in antiquity was stained with the blood of innocent children. Unwanted infants in ancient Rome were abandoned outside the city walls to die of exposure or from attacks by wild foraging beasts. By the way, that was a major thing that the church did. The church went and saved those children. Greeks often gave their pregnant women harsh doses of herbal or medicinal abortifacients. Persians developed highly sophisticated surgical curette procedures. Primitive Canaanites threw their children onto great flaming pyres as sacrifices to their god Moloch. Egyptians disposed of their unwanted children by disemboweling and dismembering them shortly after birth. Their collagen was then ritually harvested for the manufacture of cosmetic creams. None of the great minds of the ancient world, from Plato and Aristotle to Seneca and Quintilian, from Pythagoras and Aristophanes to Livy and Cicero, from Herodotus um, and Thucydides, sorry, to Plutarch, And Euripides disparaged child killing in any way. In fact, most of them recommended it. They callously discussed its various methods and procedures. They casually debated its sundry legal ramifications. They blithely tossed lives like dice. Indeed, abortion, infanticide, exposure, and abandonment were so much a part of human societies that they provided the primary uh, literary leitmotif in popular traditions, stories, myths, fables, and legends. From Romulus and Remus to Oedipus, Poseidon, 
Asclepius, uh, enough. But thanks be to God, sorry, I can't pronounce it all. But thanks be to God, the God who is the giver of life, the fountain of life, the defender of life, the prince of life, and the restorer of life, did not leave men to languish hopelessly in the clutches of sin and death. He not only sent us the message of life and the words of life, but he also sent us the light of life as well. He sent us his only begotten son, the life of the world to break the bonds of death. Jesus, Jesus tasted death for everyone, actually abolishing death for our sakes and offering us new life. The DDK, one of the earliest Christian documents, actually concurrent with much of the New Testament, asserts that there are two ways, a way of life and a way of death. In Christ, God has afforded us the opportunity to choose between the two ways, to choose between fruitful and teeming life on the one hand and barren and impoverished death on the other. Apart from Christ, it is not possible to escape the snares of sin and death. On the other hand, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And listen to this. This is the moneymaker. The primary conflict in temporal history always has been and always will be the struggle for life by the church against the natural inclinations of all men everywhere. This was the case long before Roe, and it will be long after for as long as the Lord tarries. So after Roe, what's our job now? It is the same as always. We must be gospel advocates. Gospel advocates of all that is right and good and true. We must care for the poor, the hurting, and the marginalized. Just pause here for a second. Are you willing to go adopt a kid? Like you in your current state right now. A woman who was going to have an abortion and cannot in Wyoming now, are you willing to take that child in? Because that's what we're called to do. We're called to take care of widows and orphans as the church. We must speak the truth in love. We must remind our magistrates of their responsibilities, right? In other words, he's saying, be involved. Remind the magistrates. That's what Calvin called the political leadership um, in, in um, his, his commentaries. We must remind our magistrates of their responsibilities. We must disciple. We must be unflinching in the proclamation of the good news which changes everything. Our intercessions and labors must be unceasing. Our local crisis pregnancy centers need our support like never before. Our pulpits need to ring out with practical, pastoral, and prophetic urgency like never before. And we need to remember God's glorious promise like never before. Behold, I am doing a new thing now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We are called to the gospel. We are called to preach Christ and him crucified. It has nothing to do about do we gloat over winning and all that. What it has to do with are we preaching the gospel? I remember as a young man, my, my good friend, in fact, the guy that was the best man in my wedding, um, or was part of that process. Um, he, uh, his dad was um, sending money to the 700 Club, right, f to end abortion. And I remember saying to him back in 1992, why do you do that? Why wouldn't you just send your money to a missions organization? Because we know that my minds don't change until what? The heart changes. We need to be about the gospel. Cool. We won a Supreme Court victory. By the way, until Joe Biden packs the court. Oh, well, they can't do that. We have this 
this thing called the filibuster in the Senate, and they need 60 votes to obtain closure, right? I used to teach this stuff. No, that actually is something they agree to in every term, in every session. They can kill that immediately. In fact, that's what got the last three Republican nominees into the court because the Democrats had, had abandoned that in, um, um, when, when Harry Reid was the Senate Majority Leader. Like if our faith is in the political process, if our faith is in the Supreme Court, if our faith is even in the local legislature and court, our faith is misplaced. Our faith should be in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I won't say this guy's name so he doesn't sue me. Um, Okay, I will. Um, you probably receive emails. I get them. It's from First Baptist Church, sister church, right? First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, Robert Jeffries. Here was his, his article. And I want you to ruminate on the differences, right? Because I, as I mentioned at the beginning, these two articles, these two articles demonstrate what I think is a fissure within the church right now, okay? So the last article was preach the gospel. Preach the gospel, as, as Paul said, preach Christ and him crucified. Here's what Jeffrey says. This week's Supreme Court ruling in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization is the greatest judicial reversal since Brown v. Board of, of Education overturned racial seg- segregation in schools. This is not primarily a victory for Republicans or conservatives. It is a resounding victory for millions of yet-to-be-born children who will now get to live out their God-ordained lives. Now, there's an interesting point to be made there. Um, Did did abortion frustrate the sovereignty of God? We should be opposed to it because we're called to be opposed to it. But did abortion frustrate the sovereignty of God? Did God ordain lives and man was able to step in and sever God's plan? Today's ruling is a sober reminder of the 50 years of havoc that Roe v. Wade left in its wake. 63 million children have been murdered in the womb since 1973. Without question, abortion has been the single greatest moral stain on our nation and our history. As momentous as the ruling in Dobbs is, however, we need to remember that this is not an outright national ban on abortion. By overturning Roe, the court has simply returned the authority to regulate abortion back to the state level, There will be an intense battle waged in all 50 states over this hot-button issue. The pro-life cause has won an important battle, but the war is far from over. Those who value life cannot afford to become weary in well-doing. The overturn of Roe is also an affirmation of the right and responsibility of Christians to get involved in the political process. There is only one reason Roe was overturned. In 2016, conservative Christians worked together to elect Donald Trump, and President Trump kept his promise to appoint pro-life justices to the Supreme Court. Had Hillary Clinton been elected, as some Christians hoped would happen, Roe would still be the law of the land today. Are you starting to get the, what we're talking about? The fissure that has occurred in the church On the one hand, a very political church, and on the other hand, a church that may be involved politically, but is committed to what Paul, what the Gospels have called us to, to preach Christ and Him crucified. See, I would argue that this other side, this this group that, that is a political gospel, I would argue that that is leading people to blaspheme the name of God. I would argue that Romans 2, 24 applies there. Because we're not called to do those things. We are called. And I'm not saying they're even bad. I think it's good for us to be involved in a democracy. We have a democracy. It's okay for us to participate. It's good for us to lobby and to do those things. Is that what we're known for? This is the pastor of a church. This isn't the head of a pro-life organization. This is the pastor of one of the largest churches, if not the largest church 
in Dallas, Texas. Pretty big city. This week's historic ruling, he says, is a reminder that elections have consequences. Elected leaders determine policies that can influence the moral and spiritual direction of the country. In the 1940s, German Christians, with only a few exceptions, remained silent as Hitler rose to power and murdered six million Jewish people. Thankfully, Christians in our country have refused to remain silent about the Holocaust of unborn children. Together, they affected a leadership change that in turn resulted in a policy change that will save millions of lives. Where's the gospel? I don't hear a gospel here. Here we go. This is Jeffrey's weak attempt at a gospel message in amidst his political message, which, by the way, he has a right to do, right? This is America. Jesus called Christians to be both salt and light in Matthew 5. In Jesus' day, salt was a preservative. While it couldn't prevent the decay of meat, it could delay the decay of meat. Similarly, Jesus left his disciples here on earth to delay the cultural and moral rot in our society so that we could have more time to present the hope and forgiveness Christ offers all people. And that's, I think, at best tentative, scripturally. But, but for salt to do its preserving work, it has to get out of the salt shaker and penetrate the meat. Thankfully, millions of Christians got out of the pews and penetrated the political world, resulting in this week's historic Supreme Court ruling. Just as Christians led the way in the abolition of slavery and the fight for civil rights, Christians of this generation have been instrumental in protecting our most basic right of life, the right to life. Now, again, I want to stress this. I want us, I want us to be people who are involved politically. That we live in a democracy. We have the ability where people in Rome, Christians in Rome, had no ability to do that. They lived under a dictatorship. You have the ability to go vote. You have the ability to to lobby support for things. And we should do that. In no way am I opposed to that. I've participated in that. However, what are we called to do? We are called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to preach Christ and him crucified. And if you want to impact abortion, how are you going to do that after November if Republicans lose across the board? I don't know if you know this. If you look at just simple statistics, um, there are significantly more Democratic voters than Republican voters in this country. There's significantly, well, we don't want to get into how I would parse that out. Obviously, heavily populated states are very blue in their politics, right? They're going to have significant presence in the House. And now, you can bet places like Georgia that obviously have become a bubble state, that this is something that may sway it the other way, that Republicans were counting on a win in. Is that where you want your faith to be? Or do you want your faith to be in preaching Christ and him crucified? Because in preaching Christ and him crucified, lives change. You want to impact abortion, impact it by changing lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we change lives. Conversely, I would argue that that the way, I don't know if you saw this Republican candidate for I've seen state senate and lieutenant governor. I don't know how that works in Rhode Island. Um, But a Republican candidate in um, Rhode Island at a Roe v. Wade rally punched his female opponent for that position in the face. Um, And he's also a police officer. And he's been been placed on administrative leave. Um, I I don't know what his religious faith is. But I do wonder sometimes how much the church has figuratively punched our opponent in the face with how we've talked about issues. Um, I was reading stuff on Facebook and and now comes gay marriage and, and 
we see this. And, and of, of course, of course we should be um, hopeful that America has a, is a nation of believers who does what God wants. By the way, that was never actually the case. But, but we, can, we should be hopeful for that. But lobbying a congressman who happens to have a D or an R, whatever, you, I mean, uh, roll the dice, behind his name is not going to be what gets us there. And that should not be our motivation anyway. Our motivation should be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard people, I, I've heard the hyper-Calvinist movement talk about, well, there's the elect, right? The frozen chosen. Not everyone in America is going to choose. Well, I probably agree. Not everybody in America will choose the gospel. Right? I mean, that's pretty obvious that that's the case. But you understand that Paul didn't say, well, there's only some of you who are going to choose the gospel. I'm only going to preach to a few of you. Maybe those that look like me. Maybe those that I'm only super comfortable with who won't hate me afterwards. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, I preach Christ and him crucified. And he went to the synagogue, and he preached to his Jewish brethren there, and then he went to the marketplace, which was often the center of idolatry in the, in the Gentile world, and he preached the gospel there. If we want to be what we are called to be, we do so by preaching the gospel and by loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. I was in a master's degree class years ago, and it was um, the whole focus of the class was how organizations um, seek to maintain their own existence, that they lose their mission. And all they seek to do is to maintain existence. Um, and, and it looked at, for example, the Catholic Church, right? That the Catholic Church, after just a few hundred years, Catholic, not Roman Catholic, but the universal church that then became the Roman Catholic Church, that they gave up the mission and they became about maintaining their own organizational existence. Churches are at great risk of that. They are at great risk of that. Let's be honest, in this community, I could stand up here and preach Trump and him crucified and we would get thousands of people through the door. Now, they wouldn't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't want you to perceive this in any way as a, as a Trump thing one way or the other. That's not the intent. The intent is to say, preach Christ in him crucified. That's, should, that should be our goal. We should be the church that when... When people who have a D after their party affiliation, right? When they have that and they need to they they need faith, they need the grace of our Lord that they come to. And we should be the church that if they have an R after, they should come here. Or an L. Or the taxpayers, whatever, of I mean, any like we should not, this should not be a political church. This should be a gospel church. Now, do I believe that the gospel probably points to a specific area of politics? Yeah, of course I do. Of course I do. But we need to be a gospel-oriented church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. And God, we praise you that the Supreme Court had the courage to overturn the Roe v. Wade case. We, we thank you, Father, that you have worked in this country um, to the point where that would happen. But Father, we also ask that you would help us to focus on what you have called us to focus on, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, help us to live out our testimony in a political world. Help us to live out our testimony in an economic and a social world. But Father, help us to live out our testimony. Help us to be people who love those around us. 
Help us to be a people who love a young lady who's considering an abortion. Help us to be a people who love the children that are born, that are not aborted, but abandoned. Help us to be a church that takes care of orphans. God, most of all, help us to be a church that does not lead others to blaspheme your name. God, we know that they will hate us because we follow Christ. And yet, Father, the Jews claim to follow you. And you hold against them, you held against them, that they caused the Gentiles to blaspheme your name. Father, I pray that you keep us from doing that. Help us to be known by our love. God, thank you for this group that comes faithfully. God, thank you for Romans and for Paul's message of the gospel. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.